from the audience who are just back as well. That's the European Spirit Society meeting in Madrid. It was lovely and nice and warm. And, uh, and here's the IT. No pressure. Is it working? No, Perth, Perth, Perth is not answering the phone. So that's why. Okay, so we'll just crack on, shall we? Crack on. Okay. So, so I've prepped started. It's all recorded. You'll be on YouTube. <laughs> So Perth won't be joining us, so that's, that, that's a help. So, yes, yeah, so I've been in Madrid, um, uh, where, uh, like every, everybody's speciality um, conference, which has pulled together the, the greatest minds of, uh, of your speciality, uh, and I went as well. And a lot of people in the audience were there. Um, and we're very lucky that uh, Jody Simpson, who's from Newcastle in Australia, has extended her trip from the week in Madrid to come to the UK. She started off with, a, um, with time here in Dundee, um, and I understand she's, uh, she's going to do a little bit of travelling around Scotland, a little short hop back down to Oxford, and then clear off back to Newcastle um, next, uh, next week. Um, she just told me that New- Newcastle in, in New South Wales is, is about the same sort of population, if you take in the sort of greater area, as it is in, in Tayside, that sort of half a million um, people sort of ballpark. Um, but what they've been able to produce in, in Newcastle is a world-leading uh, research centre uh, in asthma. And uh, Jody, working with Professor Peter Gibson, has done some really groundbreaking work in asthma. Um, and I'm very pleased that she's agreed to come here and talk to us about the Amazer study that she was in heavily involved in, and I understand she's going to then talk a little bit about future research um, and perhaps some collaboration with our small centre here in Dundee. So thanks very much for coming, Professor Jodie Simpson. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction, Tom, and a thanks to James and Tom for hosting me for this visit and I've had such a fun morning talking with the team about neutrophils and nets and all things inflammation so it's such a lovely thing to be able to spend a morning talking about science but today I thought I would talk a little bit about our work in asthma and inflammation and our recent uh, treatment study looking at azithromycin in adults with persistent asthma. So I thought I'd just cover briefly some of the challenges we have when we're trying to manage and treat patients with asthma. And a lot of that, I think, can be answered by understanding inflammation. And then I'll talk a little bit about the AMAZA study and what we're doing after that work. So the Global Initiative for Asthma tell us that asthma is a heterogeneous disease. And now it's changed its definition to now say usually characterised by chronic airway inflammation. Um, but I, I guess from my perspective, it's, it's if you look hard enough and if you actually measure inflammation in patients with asthma, you more often than not find it. The treatment guidelines suggest a stepwise approach in asthma where you might start off with low doses of inhaled corticosteroids and then you build up as, um, as symptoms and exacerbations require it. And what you'll notice Um, is that while you're doing this, you're not actually measuring airway inflammation until you get to the most severe disease here in step five. And these are the patients that are now eligible for monoclonal antibody therapy. And for those treatments, you must measure airway inflammation because you're required to demonstrate airway eosinophilia in order to be eligible for therapy. But what about airway inflammation in asthma? What does it look like? So these these are two different patients. These are sputum cell cytospins from two different patients with asthma. They have similar lung lung function, similar ACQ. If you had them sitting in front of you in the clinic, they would be clinically indistinguishable. But if we take their sputum sample and look at it under the microscope, you can see that they're quite different patterns of inflammation. On the left, you have some beautiful pink eosinophils there in the sputum sample. And on the right, there's an absence of those eosinophils. And in fact, there's quite a few more of what I have to confess is my favourite cell is the neutrophil. Quite a long time ago now, back in 2001, we published this study. Um, this was work I was uh, very fortunate to be part of with Peter Gibson and we looked at a group of patients with asthma and started to try and understand why some patients had eosinophils and why some didn't. And what, what I've shown you here is a uh, Gosh, it's almost a bit embarrassing to show a figure like this, but this was the acceptable figures of the day back in the early 2000s. But what we have here on this y-axis is neutrophil number 
and then interleukin-8 over here. And interleukin-8 is uh, one of the key uh, cytokines involved in neutrophil accumulation in the airways. Well, you can see in the patients... Oh, hang on, let's go back. In the patients where there is an absence of eosinophilia here in the middle, these patients have lots of neutrophils and lots of IL-8. So it gave us a clue as to what might be important and what might be going on in these patients with asthma. Despite having uh, very low eosinophil levels, these patients still have exacerbations, they still have airways hyperresponsiveness and symptoms. So clinically, they look like all other patients with asthma. A few years, uh, around the same time, but quite a few years ago now, Ruth Green did uh, this fantastic work showing that if you actually take a group of patients and measure their inflammation and then you use that knowledge to tailor their inhaled corticosteroids and their asthma treatments, you actually end up with fewer asthma attacks or exacerbations shown here in the dotted line compared to what at the time was standard BTS asthma guideline-based therapy. So this suggests to us that if you actually have a management strategy that aims to control inflammation, you can reduce severe attacks. So what does inflammation look like in stable asthma? Our early work suggested you could divide patients as to whether they had more eosinophils or less eosinophils. Don't mind me. Okay. I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> so there most certainly is... Uh, there most certainly is a group of patients who have eosinophilia in their airways. You can see my nice picture there now. And these patients have airways hyperresponsiveness, and it doesn't matter how severe your disease is, there's a, a treatment option that at least you're eligible for that you can try. There's this other group of patients who have normal levels of eosinophils and have a neutrophilia, and we, we're starting to learn more about them. I've probably been working at trying to understand these patients with asthma for the last 15 or so years. Um, they tend to be older. They have a, a, a reduced response to inhaled corticosteroids, and they have more bacteria and bacterial overgrowth, which I'll show you a little bit about in a minute. And then there's a group called porcigranulocytic asthma. We don't know much about these patients. These patients have normal levels of eosinophils and neutrophils in the airways. Not no eosinophils and neutrophils, but the same levels as people without asthma. There's quite a few patients who might have porcigranulocytic asthma who, in fact, are really just treated eosinophilic asthma. And if you weaned them off inhaled corticosteroids, they might have the reappearance of eosinophils. But even in steroid naive, naive patients and in, also in children, you have this pattern of inflammation. Now, I think um, when we first kind of coined this idea of porcigranulocytic asthma, we were thinking we would eventually find something that we could de you know, define positively in these patients. And I think we're yet to do that. But there are other inflammatory cells in the airways, and mast cells um, might be particularly important in this group. And the Lester group showed that um, people without eosinophils still had mast cell cells in the, in the muscle, in the smooth muscle. So mast cells, I think, are an important cell that we need to think about more in asthma. But I've uh, spent a lot of time working on neutrophils in asthma, and I'm going to share that with you today. So we know that neutrophils are important in the airways. They are associated with two key things that we think about in asthma, and that is airways hyperresponsive so how twitchy the airways are. And this study uh, demonstrates that the patients with asthma here, um, these are the healthy controls with the solid circles and the open circles with the, um, are the asthma patients. You can see that they have the lower number means more hyperresponsive. And so the more IL-17 they have in their airways, which is a um, marker of neutrophilic inflammation in these patients, the more hyperresponsive they are. And also over here, we can see that neutrophil counts in sputum are associated with airflow obstruction. So the more neutrophils you have, the more airflow obstruction you are likely to have. We've been interested in neutrophil subtypes. So not only is asthma as complex as having different types of inflammation, but you can also have different types of neutrophils. And these are two pretty neutrophils here with some bacteria hanging out there because that's their job. They're supposed to be going around clearing the airways of anything uh, untoward that should be there. But you can see up the top here, you can actually start and categorise neutrophils a bit more uh, closely into either a banded neutrophil, which is thought to be an immature neutrophil, 
The one in the middle is considered to be a normal neutrophil um, with a three or four lobe nucleus. And you can also get these hypersegmented neutrophils, or this one looks a bit like a four leaf clover, but they're thought to be uh, more active and older neutrophils. And so one of our students has been looking at this and actually um, found that when you go through and count neutrophils, 100 neutrophils at high power um, on a large number of patients, you can see that they're in airways disease, in COPD and in asthma, you see this increased number of these older, more active types of neutrophils. And we don't know what this means clinically or functionally, but perhaps it's important and it might shed some light on why neutrophils are in the airways, why they're staying in the airways longer and not, um, I guess, dying as they should be and, and going back through the process. So neutrophilic asthma, this, um, this figure is, I think, a really good summary of the, the main things we know about neutrophilic asthma. It's thought that things like infections, cigarette smoke and pollutants are the key triggers of neutrophilic airway inflammation. They trigger neutrophils to come into the airways. We know that there's more IL-8 and leukotriene B4 in patients with neutrophilic asthma. And we also know there's more um, neutrophil elastase. And, and here's a very preliminary picture of perhaps um, some of the newest work we're learning about neutrophils, and that's the release of neutrophil extracellular traps. These patients tend to be older, as I mentioned. They do have airways hyperresponsiveness, albeit often less severe than the, an eosinophilic phenotype. And in a small study, we also observed that they tended to have more chronic rhinositis and reflux than other inflammatory subtypes. When we looked at the airway microbiome, we actually see um, quite a difference in the microbiome in patients with neutrophilic compared with eosinophilic asthma, where in the patients with neutrophilic asthma, we tend to have this overgrowth of opportunistic bacteria, predominantly homophilus influenzae, and there tends to be less diversity. So I think that tells us that if we have asthma is not homogenous, it's quite diverse and quite different. There's different subtypes of inflammatory patterns. There's even different types of neutrophils. And it goes, I think, to tell us that uh, a treatment algorithm where we give everyone the same therapy is probably not going to be the best option. But until we have other alternative therapies, I think we're stuck with what we have. And I, I, that leads us to thinking about the macrolide antibiotics. So macrolide antibiotics are a family of antibiotics uh, that have this lactone ring here, cyclic ester ring, and they either have one or more deoxy sugar molecules. The common macrolides that might be you might be familiar with are azithromycin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, and roxithromycin, and they differ by the number of carbons in those lactone rings. We've been interested in macrolides for a little while um, because they're quite an interesting group of antibiotics in that not only do they have antimicrobial properties where they can um, impact on protein synthesis and they can improve clearance of bacteria, but they also have anti-inflammatory properties. So the work showing that they can impact on inflammatory cytokine secretion. That led us to start and think about were macrolides a potential therapy in patients with asthma? And we looked at this in a study called AMAZES. We particularly wanted to use azithromycin in this study because it has a longer half-life than the other macrolides I mentioned a few minutes ago, which means you can dose less often, and it's considered to be more acid-stable than erythromycin, so you, we hoped you would get less side effects. In terms of describing the study, the population was adults with persistent asthma. The intervention was azithromycin, 500 milligrams, three times a week for 48 weeks, and we compared this with placebo. And their primary outcome, we had co-primary outcomes of the incidence of asthma exacerbations and asthma quality of life, and this was in a placebo-controlled format. So a hypothesis was that add-on azithromycin would reduce exacerbations or attacks by 
and we would see a significant improvement in quality of life and symptom scores, but we thought that this would be predominantly in patients with non-eosinophilic asthma, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. The primary endpoint, as I mentioned, were exacerbations in quality of life, but we also wanted to monitor safety and look at QTC, hearing, hearing loss, and azithromycin-resistant organisms, and we had some secondary endpoints around inflammation. We conducted this study at eight centres around Australia. I, I use this map to try and put into context um, some of the challenges with doing a multi-centre study in Australia. So there's most people in Australia live on the east coast, not many live in the middle, and then the rest live over in Perth. Um, but we, had, we were fortunate that we had a centre in Perth, one in Adelaide, and two in Brisbane, and the remainders were in Sydney, and the main centre was our group in Newcastle. So we had eight centres. At a glance, we randomised 420 participants. They had to be non-smoking adults with asthma. They needed to be symptomatic despite being prescribed inhaled corticosteroids and a long-acting beta agonist. And I say being prescribed because we can't be sure that they were taking those medicines, but we do know that's what they were asked to take. And they needed to have stable disease, so no exacerbations, no infections for four weeks prior to entry. We excluded people with substantial parenchymal disease if they had hearing impairment um, or if they had an abnormal QTC. So eight visits over the course of the 48 weeks and we phoned them every second week to just check in on them and see if they were taking their treatment if they'd had any exacerbations. This is the consort diagram. So we screened 582 patients to randomise 420. 108 of those were excluded because they didn't meet the inclusion criteria and 54 were for various other reasons, like they decided that they didn't want to continue. Or um, I don't know about here in Scotland, but a lot of... Um, this is an older population, which I'll show you in a minute, but often people like to go on long, long holidays and get their caravan and drive around Australia, so we have quite a few that start and then decide to go on a nice long holiday. But anyway, we randomised 420, 213 received azithromycin, 207 received placebo. If we look at the participant, participant characteristics, this is the inflammatory phenotype at baseline. So I've divided it into the eosinophilic group, the neutrophilic and the porcigranulocytic, but there's also a small group of patients that have a mixed phenotype. So they have high eosinophils and neutrophils. And um, you might be familiar with the term T2 high, um, and the eosinophilic and the mixed group would be considered T2 high in this population. The participants tended to be an older group of adults. They had a median age of 60 years. They had long-standing asthma of, with, on average, 32 years duration. Predominantly, they were atopic to common allergens. Around a third had smoked in the past, with seven and a half pack years, the median smoking pack years. They were treated with high-dose corticosteroids most often and a long-acting bronchodilator. Usually that was a long-acting beta agonist, but it, in some patients it was a long-acting muscurinic. They were poorly controlled with a mean asthma control questionnaire of 1.5. This is the key outcome slide for the study. So we have the number of exacerbations here on the y-axis and the duration of treatment. And azithromycin here is the blue line, but you can see that there's a significant reduction in exacerbations in the patients who received azithromycin therapy. And the median exacerbation-free days was 344 days for those who received azithromycin compared with 148 in placebo. As I mentioned, we, we were quite convinced that we were going to see this effect in one particular inflammatory subtype, but I wanted to show you uh, this figure, which shows you the effect when we divided patients according to whether they had an eosinophilic or a non-eosinophilic subtype. So this is everyone up here, the 420. Here's the non-eosinophilic patients and the eosinophilic patients. You can see that it didn't matter which inflammatory subtype you were. Everyone had a favourable response to azithromycin in terms of a reduction in exacerbations, which we were quite surprised about and are still trying to understand. So I'll be looking for, hopefully some of you might have some great suggestions at the end that we can have a think about and discuss. Quality of life and asthma control score both were significantly improved in azithromycin, although clinically these changes were quite modest. 
So the asthma control score improved from 1.3 to 1.2. That's not really considered a clinically important improvement, but it was a statistically significant improvement. We looked at symptom scores using a visual analogue scale, and I, I show these here, the median scores on the y-axis, and these are the different symptoms we asked patients about. But you'll notice that particularly sputum production, cough, and nasal symptoms were improved in patients who received azithromycin. So I, I guess that idea about cough and spit and reducing those things when you add on azithromycin. We also uh, categorised, asked patients when they had an asthma exacerbation to, to tell us what medications they took, and we looked at the number of antibiotic-treated respiratory infections, and you'll see here that the patients who received azithromycin add-on therapy actually had a significant reduction in the number of antibiotic-treated respiratory infections. In terms of adverse outcomes and infections, there was uh, diarrhoea was a lot more common in the azithromycin group um, compared with placebo. We had four patients withdraw in the azithromycin group because of diarrhoea and three in the placebo group. So quite uh, wasn't, uh, I guess, severe, but there was a higher incidence of diarrhoea. We had no specific hearing loss or QTC uh, prolongation in those patients who received azithromycin. The adverse events due to a clinically diagnosed infection were, as I showed in the last figure, fewer in the azithromycin group. We did baseline microbiology using typical culture in, from the PATH lab, and at baseline we had culture on 244 participants, of which 20% had a potentially pathogenic microorganism identified, and 38 of those, uh, 18 or 38% were azithromycin resistant at baseline. At the end of treatment, we, still, we had a similar number of uh, organisms identified, but a higher rate of azithromycin-resistant organisms at 51%. So in conclusion of the main part of the study, we concluded that adults who had persistent symptomatic asthma despite taking inhaled steroids or long-acting beta agonists actually uh, result or experienced fewer exacerbations of their asthma and fewer respiratory infections when treated with oral azithromycin for 48 weeks. So we, I think from this study we were able to say that azithromycin is an effective treatment in reducing asthma attacks. And in terms of the safety things we measured, azithromycin was safe. So it may be a useful add-on therapy in patients with persistent symptomatic asthma. But how, do they, how are the macrolides reducing exacerbations? And I think that's a really uh, key question for us to understand, um, to be able to confidently recommend these in clinical practice, because we, uh, we want to make sure we target uh, a medicine like a macrolide to the right patients. So we've been looking at soluble inflammatory mediators in the microbiome to try and answer this. So we collected sputum samples for as, from as many people as possible. Uh, in the study, we dispersed the sputum with dithiothriol to get our total and differential cell counts. We also collected cell-free supernatant for inflammatory markers, and raw sputum was stored for our microbiome analysis. And we did this at, um, before treatment started at visit two and at the end of treatment. First of all, I wanted to share with you the uh, impact of azithromycin on sputum neutrophils and eosinophils. So you'll see here the log eosinophil count and the log neutrophil count on the y-axis, and azithromycin in red, placebo and blue. And what you'll notice is that there was no effect of azithromycin on sputum eosinophil or neutrophil numbers. When we looked at interleukin-8 and TNF-alpha, which are two key pro-inflammatory mediators, interleukin-1-beta particularly involved in um, inflammasome activation and TNF-alpha, a subsequent product of inflammasome activation. You can see here again in the red bars a significant reduction in interleukin-1-beta and TNF-alpha in those patients who received add-on azithromycin compared with placebo. We... Um, don't have the same sophisticated uh, ways to look at extracellular DNA and neutrophil extracellular traps, which is why I'm here visiting in Dundee today to work on a collaborative project with James Chalmers' group. But we, we have this crude measure of 
measuring extracellular DNA. Um, and that's a way to try and see how much DNA is in the cell free supernatant to start and understand what might be going on with extracellular traps. And what you'll see here is the log eDNA on the y-axis and a significant reduction in those patients who received an azithromycin. So we're starting to get this picture in amazes, although the cell counts haven't changed, we know attacks have been reduced, but we're getting these changes in inflammatory markers. So something's going on there in the airways. And I'll just... Um, thought I would remind us all that we, when we looked for antibiotic treatments for infection in amazes, that effect was specifically in the patients with non-eosinophilic asthma. So here's, overall you get a positive effect of everyone, but when we looked by asthma subtype, patients with eosinophilic asthma didn't receive a positive effect in terms of antibiotic treatments for infection without on azithromycin. It was the non-eosinophilic patients. So we went, we divided our data and had a look more closely at the inflammatory subtype. And this is interleukin-1 beta again, but you'll notice this time we have the non-eosinophilic patients on the left and eosinophilic on the right. And what you'll notice is there's a quite marked reduction specifically in the non-eosinophilic patients that received azithromycin. We don't see this significant reduction in the eosinophilic patients. We also looked at the airway microbiome and found that the microbiome is also altered with add-on azithromycin. We don't see any change here. This is the azithromycin patients. There's no change in the load of bacteria in the airways. There's a reduction in the diversity of bacteria in the azithromycin patients. And there's also a change in specific taxa in the airways. So in this, um, I've shown you the Haemophilus influenzae here, in the placebo in the red and the azithromycin in the blue. And what you'll notice is there's this marked reduction in copies of Haemophilus influenza in the patients who received azithromycin. And we didn't see this in other taxa. So we also looked at Pseudomonas, Streptococcus, Moraxella, and a lot of their common pathogens. This seemed to be specific to Haemophilus influenzae. So add-on azithromycin therapy reduces asthma attacks. It seems to reduce soluble inflammatory mediators, particularly those involved in the innate immune response. It impacted on the microbiome diversity and Haemophilus influenzae copy numbers, and much of this was in non-eosinophilic patients. So our next step for this work is to keep collaborating here in Dundee and start and look more closely at the neutrophil extracellular traps. So this is um, part of the mechanism, um, I guess, where neutrophils can go wrong. So when neutrophils come into the airways and perform their usual function, they would undergo programmed cell death of apoptosis and be eaten by a macrophage. When that goes wrong, they can release their uh, intracellular contents, including their DNA and lots of their damaging proteases and cause airway damage. And then look at integrating our microbiome work with our nets and our proteomics work. So a study like this obviously um, involves a huge number of people. So a big shout out to the team in Newcastle uh, who worked hard on the data that I've presented today, but also the Amazes of investigators. And the study was funded by our National Health and Medical Research Council. And also want to acknowledge the work from Stephen Taylor and Grant Rogers from the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute who've uh, been so fundamental in helping us understand the microbiome data. Thank you. Right, don't run away. Don't run away. So it, I, it's, um, it's very rare uh, to have papers that have such a massive impact. So I, I want to use the word seismic impact, and that's perhaps a little hyperbolous, but, it, but really, think that really changed the way we think about uh, diseases in respiratory medicine, certainly. So Ruth Green's paper back in 2002 was a major shift in how we thought about asthma. Um, the post hoc analysis of torch and, and the steroid impact was a major thing, and this has been a massive impact in how we think about asthma. It's very rare that a single paper goes to 
influence guidelines to the extent that your paper has done, and I think we should really recognise the, the work that you did. It's been absolutely fantastic for us in, in, in asthma. Um, this, has, uh, this has turned on now, so we can have some questions. I, I'll take Chair's privilege and ask first, though. Um, Guy Brassell in, in, um, in Ghent did a very similar study. You knew this question was coming. Did a very similar study and didn't quite see the same impact that you oh, saw. Yeah. So I've heard what he has to say about this because I asked him yesterday. So <laughs> why do you think you had such a big impact in both of the types, so the neutrophilic and the acidophilic, when he only really saw it in the neutrophilic group? I think it's, it's a really good question, and it certainly wasn't our expectation that we would see this, and our early work suggested that we would see a change only in the non eosinophilic and then we actually struggled when we designed the study. Um, in fact, I was pushing very strongly not to include the eosinophilic patients, so I was outvoted perhaps just as well um, that we were able to include everyone. Um, I think they're slightly different groups of patients, so clinically they're quite different. Um, we, we use different dosing, I think, is, so we, I think Guy used 250... Oh, is it daily? I think a 250 daily. a day. We use 500 three times a week. I think there's a lot we don't understand about how macrolides work. So Guy's work came out as we were halfway through. And we thought, oh, it's all answered now. There's nothing. But then we found quite a different outcome. I don't have a simple, straightforward answer. And I think that as we continue to try and... That's why the work that we're doing now is, I guess, so important to try and understand that and tease that out, because I think we've shown that there's a clear benefit in, non -eos in eosinophilic asthma as well as non-eosinophilic asthma, and whether that's through, we discussed this morning, whether it's through pre uh, prevention of viral-induced exacerbations, whether it's through some mechanism where you might increase responsiveness to your steroids that you're already taking, we don't know. Or the hemophilus. I think the hem your hemophilus data is really powerful and, and ties in with the, the, the bronchiectasis side of work, yeah. that that's, we see that that they work very well in patients with haemophilus. Guy's answer to it is that his study wasn't long enough. And that well, your, your data months, split, yeah. they were six months, you were yeah. a year, and, and you see that split in the eosinophilic group later on. Yeah, it is a bit later. And that's difficult I mean, to I explain guess, as well. Yeah, it is. It is a bit later. But then I think that might also suggest the different mechanisms in the two phenotypes. Mm. Um, and certainly the data we're seeing now with the inf inflammatory markers is suggesting something's going on around that innate immune um, neutrophil stuff, but we don't, we're not seeing that in the eosinophilic, so I think teasing that out. What we have seen in the eosinophilic um, patients, which I just realised I didn't put that slide in, is we do see a reduction in IL-6 in the airways, but not in the serum, so a, a localised, an airway reduction in IL-6. So I don't know, that was one of the few things we saw in the eosinophilic patients, mm. um, as well as the non-eosinophilic, so I don't know if that gives us some clues as to a common mechanism in everyone. Anybody else got any questions or comments from the floor? Uh, James, of course. Hang on. So you, you started the talk by showing your very nice previous work showing that IL-8 was the key driver of neutrophil recruitment, So I, but I didn't see IL-8 as one of the ones that you'd measured in the I haven't the measured cytokines. it yet. Is it because you don't want to know the answer? Because no, the neutrophils I, didn't go down. No, I, you know what? I kind of moved on to IL-1 beta. <laughs> <laughs> IL-8 was my favourite thing to talk about neutrophils. And then we started to look at the inflammasome and IL-1 beta. And, um, and I think certainly work, um, work from um, Lester and Mona's group around IL-1 beta and exacerbation. So I kind of focused on that. But not, not because I don't, I don't... I think IL-8 will have gone down. I, I wonder if it, if it would as well. So if I can take the privilege of a second question. You know I have this uh, theory that it may be viral-induced exacerbations that are being prevented because it's hard to understand how people with lots of different types of diseases yes, get the same, the same level of benefit. So what's common between them all? Lots, all respiratory patients get viruses. Have you looked at seasonal effects in the, in the study, whether... You've, you've looked at yeah. exacerbations across a whole year, but are they reduced in particular periods of time in different groups? I don't think we've done that by phenotype. So we've um, looked at the main data and kind of corrected for season, but I haven't looked at it within individual phenotypes to see if that changes, and that's a good idea. With the virus question, I also wonder if it's not so much preventing viral exacerbations, but whatever azithromycin's improving 
means that your immune system is then able to fight off a virus more effectively. So I, um, I'm still, yes, have to have another morning of discussing how that might work and how we can test that question because it's a tricky one to tease out. Thanks for a great talk. I was really struck by the size of Australia and how you go from tropical Darwin down to um, Hobart. Did you notice any differences between sites? Because they're obviously very different environments that you're sampling. And Belgium, maybe that's part of it, they, they are sampling from cold north Europe and you've got a different environment. I think, unfortunately, in our study, you might have noticed that the samples all came from... This, although it was west and east coast, roughly the same area. So we didn't have a, a centre, uh, a tropical centre, if you like, in North Queensland or Darwin, and, and we didn't have a centre in Hobart. So we, in our analysis, we corrected for the, the site that they were from, but in terms of those changes in environment, um, it's hard to say, I think, whether there was that kind of impact. But I think in terms of asthma... Uh, if you think about asthma and phenotypes and things like that, the striking thing about neutrophilic asthma is it's been reported pretty much everywhere that anyone's looked for it. So Scotland, the UK, Europe, China, um, you know, the US. So it seems to be something that's common around the same, a similar prevalence regardless of the, the environment. Although I have wanted to... I don't know if I told James this when I earlier, but I have wanted to do a study in the Highlands because... I'm sure there's no neutrophilic asthma when the air's extra clean. <laughs> uh, just a quick question from a jobbing respiratory clinician. Um, it's clear that this has an effect on all asthmatics when they're uncontrolled. And I think it's equally clear that particularly the neutrophilic asthmatics benefit from it. The difficulty I have is twofold. One is we've got lots and lots of different treatments for people with eosinophilic asthma mm -hmm. and not very much for neutrophilic asthma. But also there's also this concern of ongoing resistance to azithromycin yeah. beyond one year and using it as a panacea seems a little yeah. previous if I might say that. So yeah. what, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Well I guess I agree with you. There's lots of therapies out there now that seem to be effective if you have high eosinophils. There's not a lot out there for you if you don't. So this is perhaps something to consider. Um, and, I, and we were talking this morning, I do think it's worth measuring inflammation in, in, um, in your patients to try and get an understanding of what it's looking like, and that might help with some of that. We don't know in asthma what happens with treatment beyond a year. I think um, there is some data now in CF We've, we have looked at resistance as best as we've been able to in this study and certainly um, you, know, you see an increase in azithromycin resistant organisms. We don't know what that means clinically and the, we've started looking at resistance genes and you certainly see an increase in resistance genes. I think there was eight in Stephen's work that he found that were increased in the azithromycin group. But again, we, we're a bit unclear of um, what that means in clinical practice and what that means to an individual patient compared to a more population concern around antibiotic resistance. And there was a really interesting talk at the ERS yesterday which talked about um, resistance genes in the environment. Um, so I think there's so much we don't, we've got yet to learn about resistance to antibiotics. Um, the, what I know that a lot of, well, some of the clinicians in Australia are doing um, are, are using macrolides over the winter or to having treatment holidays and things like that. So I think that's some, uh, something that people are trying. But I don't, I mean, we don't have any kind of large major studies to show that. I'm looking at James to see if he might want to weigh in on in bronchiectasis, what happens, but he's shaking his head. <laughs> I, can, uh, I have a couple of bronchiectasis patients who only take their macrolide in the winter. Yeah. They, they say, oh, it makes no difference to me in the summer, so I don't take it. And then they get to when the clocks go back or mm. October or whenever and decide that's when I'm going to start taking macrolide and on it goes. I have absolutely no idea whether that is when there's no evidence base for it. But that, when people start deciding for themselves, and it makes you think about the viruses that James talked about yeah. and, it, and, and that's a treatment holiday that they've instigated themselves yeah. so I think we'll, so we'll I don't probably think find out it's evidence based but I think it happens yeah. and yeah. I hear more and more clinicians talking about this idea that their patients take it over the winter period and um, feel like that's doing James has another question 
there was, there's something really interesting about the antibiotic data that you showed, yeah. that the, the non-eosinophilic yeah. patients got at least double the amount of antibiotics. But the doctors that are providing the antibiotics presumably don't have access to your sputum data or your microbiome data. Oh, no. So, no. so they're just seeing the patient and yeah. going, I think this person should have antibiotics. Yeah. Um, yeah, it which was means completely there has, a clinical there has to be something about them that the jobbing doctor can see that means yeah. I want to give this person Absolutely. So it was at the physician's discretion when the patient had an exacerbation of what they wanted to prescribe, whether that be oral steroids, antibiotics, both, neither. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So. Any ideas what, what the doctors can see? That I don't have any... I, well, I, I don't have any evidence. I suspect cough and spit might come into it. Um, but I, yeah, I don't. That would just be my guess. You've got quite significant reductions in IL-1, beta, and TNF alpha. Where do you think they're being made? If the neutrophil numbers haven't changed. Do you think because macrophages make a lot of those things too? And do you think there's influences in other cells within the airway that are important here? I think there's a couple of ex possible explanations. So it could be that that it's. Um, that it's other cell production, or it could be that it's not about the number of neutrophils in your airways, but about how active they are or what they're doing. Um, so I guess I'm, I think I favour that explanation um, in that you might have you might not change the number, but you might change how active they are, or how um, how they're dying, or how functional they are. So are they able to clear bacteria or not? So I think that might be what we're changing, and I think the work we're going. To work on over the next few months, hopefully we'll start and give us some answers into that. Well, I fear that we're going from friendly Q&A to interrogation, so let's oh, perhaps... That's okay. uh, <laughs> has anybody else got any questions or comments? Then we'll perhaps draw things to a close. I certainly didn't feel like interrogation. You feel, like you're, you're feel all right. right. That's good. So, um, next week at Grand Rounds, uh, Professor Grunberg is coming all the way from America um, to talk about stroke thrombectomy. Now, I'm not here because I've been dragged away to Chicago, so um, I know it's a tough, it's a tough gig. Um, so if anybody else would like to volunteer to chair Grand Round and speak to me afterwards, I'd be very I'm happy to show you how to make the IT work. Um, <laughs> and I look forward to watching the video on, on, on YouTube, which reminds me, you can, can re-watch this on YouTube uh, if, you've, uh, if you missed any of it or just want to revisit the slides. If you want to speak to Jody, I'm sure she'll take more questions afterwards uh, if you're interested in any of the aspects of what's going on there or if you're a doctrine training who wants to go and work in Australia for a bit um, and I'd just like to thank Jody for a fantastic talk and for your participation as well and I'll see you in a fortnight <laughs> okay thanks very much <laughs>